Good morning. Uh, could I welcome you all to today's meeting of the uh, Public Petitions uh, Committee? And as always, can I remind everyone uh, to turn off any mobile phones or electronic equipment because it does interfere with our sound system. Um, could I welcome today uh, from the gallery some of our guests from the City of Edinburgh Council? I understand that they've set up uh, their own petitions committee and they're reserving us today, so you're very welcome. And uh, perhaps we can reserve your petitions committee uh, uh, in due course. Um, agenda item one, a decision in taking business in private. The first item of business seeks the committee's agreement to take item four in private. Is the committee agreed that this item should be taken in private? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two, consideration of new petitions. The next item of business is consideration of new petitions. There are two new petitions for consideration today, and as previously agreed, the committee will have evidence of one of these new petitions. So the first new petition is PE1465 uh, by Tony Ivanov on maintenance of vacant land and private ownership. Members, I note by the clerk the spice briefing and the petitions. Uh, Mr Ivanov, you're very welcome. Uh, thank you for coming along to the committee today. Uh, perhaps you can give us uh, a brief opening statement, followed by a question from myself and my colleagues. Mr Ivanov. OK, thank you. Good morning, everyone. The, um, t I brought this petition uh, on behalf... It started out on, the by, on behalf of the local community. It was regarding plots of land that normally in housing estates we have developers, when they create them, they create various green belts, so to speak. Some for children's play areas, um, others just for looking nice for the community. Now, over the course of time, for various reasons, these lands have been acquired by speculators in the hope that they can build on them. They've taken away children's playgrounds, etc. Now, what's happened, though, is a lot of these people have been getting refused planning permission because the ground's either not suitable or for various other reasons. And they're just letting them go into disrepair. And I've given some photos there just to give an indication of what I'm talking about. Uh, they're spoiling the community. Uh, it's they're just an eyesore. They're a breeding ground for vermin, etc. Now, for 20 years anyway, we've been trying to get something done about this in the local community. Now, it goes beyond the local community because I took it to MSPs. Unfortunately, my regional MSP, uh, I've just totally ignored all my, my requests from him uh, trying to get things done. So I, I did take it to another one. And he informed me that this is a national issue. It extends to the whole of Scotland. In fact, probably England as well, but we'll deal with Scotland. And uh, I thought, well, if it's a national issue, what can we do? And in the end was to say, well, look, why don't we petition Parliament? So I thought, I'll give this a go and see how we get on from here. So this is the reason why I've, I've brought this here, is to see if anything could be done, because there is absolutely nothing, no law that says that these people or landowners or whatever are uh, obliged to keep their ground in a, a respectable manner uh, for the community. So that's what I want to try and see if we can achieve. Well, thank you very much for coming along um, to the Petitions Committee and for presenting the petition uh, to us. Um, myself and my colleagues have a few questions before we look at the next steps to try and get more information about your petition. Um, as, you pro as you probably know, um, the, in some of the briefings that we've been given, uh, it was pointed out the Town and Country Planning Act of 1997 does provide councils with the ability to action and abate adverse effects. I mean, it might not be something you have to hand, but have you tried to use that legislation at all to try and resolve your problem? We've been hammering, along with my uh, local council, we've been hammering in the council, and they've looked into it in depth, and they say they've come back at every stage and said there is absolutely nothing that can be done. Uh, my, the MSP that was helping me out, Mark uh, Griffith, uh, is it Griffith? I, uh, um, he came back as well. The only thing we came up with, there is a similar type of petition being submitted in the past. Um, it's consultation on maintenance of land in private housing estates, but it covers a different issue, you know, where they, they create a, a piece of, pieces of ground, but all the occupiers are responsible for it, and it's a land management agreement. So it's totally different from what we're asking here. Uh, well, thanks for that. I think obviously, it's for the committee side, but it may be all but worth us actually approaching the Scottish Government to get a bit more detailed understanding of how the Act's working in practice. But you certainly have raised a very important point, and I'm sure my colleagues will have some other questions I want to raise. Can I start with John Wilson? 
Good morning. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr Ivanov. Uh, you cleared up one of the issues I was going to uh, question you on, and that was the issue about the ground maintenance contracts. And clearly, the photographs that you've provided for us today are very useful, but don't take into account the ground maintenance of the areas that you're actually talking about, uh, because you have mentioned, made reference to play areas. Now, my understanding is that where uh, housing development takes place, developers are then were asked to put something back in kind to the community in, in many respects. It used to be a play area in, the, in a central area to allow children the full use of those facilities. Uh, but you indicated in your oral presentation that some of these play areas have been now purchased by, as you described them as, speculators. Yes. Uh, now, my understanding <laughs> is these play areas should have actually come under a common uh, agreement by the householders in the area to maintain that or through the land management scheme uh, to maintain the play areas uh, to a reasonable standard. Are you saying that that's not happening? That's not happening. The ground, I can only, I'll speak for my own housing estate uh, on this play area on this and it may be representative of you know, others throughout the, the country. The, the developer uh, who created the housing estate, the play area that was there, the developer went bust. And I think perhaps maybe it was a time when they tried to recoup costs, etc., and they've sold these bits of land off. But th they have been sold off. According to my council, these lands were sold off. Yeah. Now, I don't know if perhaps even they were property of the council at one time even. Maybe the council did, and they've sold them off to, you know, get rid of some of the family silver, so to speak. But they are in private ownership now. And what's happening is, I say, the people, because they're getting refused the planning permission, they, all these grounds are, are just an eyesore in the communities. The, the reason why I was asking that is that many of the, the planning consents that were granted to developers should have actually entailed the detail of what play areas and other facilities should have been constructed as part of the consent to build. Now, if you're saying that what's happened in this situation is the developer put forward plans to build houses, included in those plans a play area, and what you're now saying is that play area has been transferred, or the land the play area stood on, has now been transferred to another developer or a speculator, as you've described them. I find that difficult to understand, given that if the planning consent detail that a play area had to be provided, why the play area was then sold on to a speculator. Mm -hmm. Have you given it? Have you I given understand it? what you're saying, yes, sir. As I say, I don't know. I only can go on what the council uh, has told me when they did, uh, you know, when they looked into it. And the, the, my present councillor and the, the councillor that preceded her, um, we've done it for years, at least 10 years, we were battling. And, every time they've come up and said, this is the situation. So we just have to accept what the council says to me. You know, if they say, this is such and such, I've got to take it for granted that that's what it is. And likewise with MSPs, uh, when I took the MSPs, uh, it's the same thing. I've just got to take on spec. You know, I've, I've done my bit asking them for the information. If they come back and tell me one thing, I'm sorry, I've got to accept it. Leave it that at the moment, convener. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Um, I hear what you say about you having to take what the council tell you. Yeah, it's not necessarily a, a route that some of us would pursue. Uh, have you checked who actually owns the lands that you're talking about? Are they actually registered? Uh, Certainly two plots uh, at, at uh, my own local uh, area, uh, yes, we've, my councillor has found out they got the council to do the check on the land registry, uh, and I believe they've approached them, uh, the people who owned the land, but to no avail. They approached them under the base of the... the they wanted... Um, to tighten them up because... Uh, once it, uh, all, all they did was, on, on uh, one situation was, there's, you'll see one of the photographs, there's a public footpath, uh, and it was overgrown, blocking the footpath. Eventually, it was actually the council that came and cut it, I, I presume they'll maybe bill the, the person.
but the, the donor just wasn't interested. And on the basis of his lack of interest, has anybody approached the health and safety executive? I don't. The council see the they've done health. everything. They keep coming back and saying it's not. This is a. I, I keep every every month. I keep on at the council, hoping that somewhere along the line someone will say, "Oh, look, we better do something about this." But it's not. Uh, they just keep coming back with the same answer to me. Look, our hands are tied. Nothing we can do. There is no legislation that we can do. Had it been council property, yes, but because it's in private ownership, there's nothing we can do. Yeah, the local authority still has a responsibility under the planning acts. Um, have you approached? Have you thought of approaching uh, anybody outside the uh, outside the local authority, okay. like the health and safety executive, for example? No, I would, I would, I, I would have thought that uh, the MSP uh, Mark Griffith, uh, who was uh, helping with it, uh, I would have thought that he would have advised me if there was such. I've got to take, you know, I've got to put my trust in them and say, well, look, he's more educated on these subjects than I am. If there is a way, an avenue to go down, he should say to me, we could do this or you could do this, uh, but. It's not been forthcoming. Are there any, just pursuing that, are there any health implications because these areas are not being developed? Well, there is, a, there is vermin, uh, but, and again, the council come back and say, well, it's such as mice, they can't do anything about it because mice are natural. Had it been rats and they were, you know, infestating people's homes, as a result, then maybe they could take action there. But it's more so these pieces of ground are just a complete eyesore in the communities. Angus MacDonald. It's just unfortunate I seem to be the one that's taking the action here. Yeah? No, no, it's, it's quite courageous, quite, quite right. You sure there are no tigers in there now? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Mind you, I, I, I had thought of maybe trying to get uh, a farmer to supply me with 100 rats or something to throw in, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, best not go there, convener. Um, good, good morning, uh, Mr Ivanov. Um, I think we can uh, all identify areas in our constituencies uh, where, where land has been virtually abandoned and lies un, untended and, and unkempt. Um, however, it's probably fair to say that uh, different local authorities perhaps... Uh, do not prioritise this issue in a way that uh, that we, we would all like them to, uh, or, or prefer them to do. Um, the position of local authorities, it would seem to me, uh, is made more difficult by the fact that there's no criminal sanction um, for failure to comply with a waste land notice. Um, and perhaps that's uh, an issue that the, the committee should uh, take up. It's, it's a salient point that we should perhaps bring to the attention uh, of the Scottish Government and COSLA. Um, with a view to encouraging revised legislation which would allow for criminal sanctions um, to be imposed. And that would seem to me to be uh, uh, giving the local authorities an extra uh, hammer to, 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 uh, to, to hit the, the, the landowners with. Um, would you agree that that might be a, a step? Uh, it certainly right needs something done. It's because if, it, if it's, it's obvious that, well, from the feedback I got, it, it's become, it's all over the place. I really don't think they should get away with it. I have nothing in pe against people, speculators, trying to make a profit for themselves in the future. But at least, if you own a piece of land, keep it tidy. Let the community see it. It's, it's OK. But it's just a blight on the communities, all these plots that are just going into disrepair. Absolutely. I've, I've got um, immense uh, sympathy with your, with your point, and uh, hopefully we can um, you know, perhaps look at uh, changing legislation to ensure that there is a penalty uh, available to local authorities to impose on, on landowners and speculators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and welcome. Um, I feel your frustration um, within the cause of the issue, um, but I admire your strength for keep on, you know, hard at it to try and resolve this issue, and thank you for bringing the issue to your attention. Convener, I think it would... Whilst you had said that there had been part of the law earlier, it's clear that it's not working in practice. So I think it would be important for us for to contact Scottish Government and COSLA um, for the details of how that legislation 
is working in practice or not working in practice, so to speak. So even if we're highlighting this specific petition towards them for to, to get some answers. At, at one point, these plots of ground, even though they were in private ownership, they weren't fenced off. Uh, I can only speak for my uh, area at the moment, but I imagine it might be the same elsewhere. Uh, the councils used to tend to it. It was grassed areas, and they, they would cut it. But then the landowners, certainly in my area, what they did was told the council, no, stop it. Because they were, they were, they were, I think they were just wanting to get the land to build. They just wanted to build. So they said, stop it. And some bits, they fenced it off, stopped the council going in. And I think that idea is, look, if we let this go into a bad state, the council's going to say eventually, look, let's just give them the planning permission. Uh, and that's it over and done with. But, as I say, there are reasons why the Council won't give planning permission in various areas, uh, and it, it should be adhered to. Okay, thank you. Any other member wish to ask a question? Um, I think clearly then there's questions about um, the current state of the law and how uh, useful it has been. Um, it certainly makes sense, I think, to write, as other members suggested, the Scottish Government in COSLA. John Wilson? Mayor, could I also suggest we write to Falkirk Council uh, to ask them the views on this. Uh, I'm particularly interested in Mr Ivanov's uh, explanation that open space that was set aside as part of a housing development, and as I mentioned earlier, Convener, would have been part of the planning consent, are now being sold off to, once again, use Mr Ivanov's term, speculators, uh, and they hope that they'll be eventually be able to build on those uh, pieces of ground. But the difficulty I have, Convener, is that if planning consent was given to a developer with open space included in that development, then there is a, an onus on either the developer or the residents in an area to actually maintain that open space. So the, there's issues about what has been done in the intervening period from the estate being built and the land being sold off, particularly concerned, convener, about the allegation that play areas uh, have been sold off to uh, other uh, potential developers. Because, as I said, the play areas were part of the community gain yeah. for a development and where uh, many local authorities insisted in new housing estates and they still insist that play areas should be included in those developments. And if what's happened with the, in this situation is the developer sold it off, but has then allowed the land to turn to natural vegetation mm -hmm. uh, and not be kept in a proper manner or f manner that would be expected by other residents in the area, then that is clearly an issue that needs to be dealt with. But it would be useful just to examine yeah. Falkirk Council's uh, responses to some of the issues raised by Mr yeah. Ivanov. Jackson Carlo? Uh, I, think, I think Mr Ivanov's um, petition is very useful. Uh, the, um, I think more of, we probably imagined more was actually being done than it appears there is. Uh, common sense, one of these stages where common sense is not very common after all in terms of application. I notice neither we nor the government have considered the issue for a number of years, but the weaknesses inherent in paragraph five, I think, of the advice we've received. And I think if we're writing to ministers, we should specifically ask how many appeals have been served to them to avoid having to implement um, a wasteland notice, because I think that might give us an early indication of how many such wasteland notices would have been served, because the very clear sort of suggestion here is that uh, somebody who's been served one of these notices can avoid doing anything about it until an appeal has been heard by ministers. So part of me thinks inevitably if you were served with a notice, that would be the course of action you would take to avoid having to incur any cost or do anything. I think we find that there are very few then maybe we do need to write more broadly or maybe we should be writing more broadly to local authorities in any event to see how often these um, notices are actually being served and what criteria they apply because the suspicion is growing that perhaps a number of them take the view with no particular sanction in place that it's really all a bit of a bother they'd rather not get involved in. And I do think that this is one of these areas that... Uh, we all have constituents who imagine that more is being done, and I think we probably did too. Just to, <coughs> I, I would um, echo that, support that. Uh, that was going to be my question. Why particularise a uh, Falkirk Council? I know that they, you know, clearly it's the one that Mr Ivanov has uh, concerns with, but I think uh, Jackson Carlos 
the point is well made that we should really be asking the question of several councils, so we can take a random sample, or indeed all of them, in terms of uh, you know how many wasteland notices have they issued, uh, uh, it, let's say, over the last five years. I suspect mm. we'll find it's probably nil. Mm. I mean, obviously, we also suggested, you know, writing to COSLA on the basis they represent uh, all local authorities. Um, so hopefully we get some sort of cross-representation of what local authorities' views are on this issue. Yeah. Other members wish to contribute? Are members happy with that course of action that being identified by various members, including myself? Yes. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much um, for coming along today and uh, for presenting your petition. As you've heard, the committee is very interested in the comments that you've raised. Um, our staff will keep you up to date with developments, and we're certainly right to all the bodies that you've outlined. And once we've had the answers back, we'll discuss it again at a future meeting of the Petitions Committee. So thanks again for giving evidence. I'll suspend for one minute to allow our witness to leave. Thank you again for coming along. Thank you. Restart our committee. The second new petition today is PE 1466 uh, by William Tate on local authority charges for non residential services. Members have a note by the clerk, it's paper two, the spice briefing and the petition. Um, can I um, invite uh, John Wilson um, to start consideration of this petition? Convener, uh, welcome the petition by Mr. Tate. Uh, I think this uh, petition highlights concern uh, from a number of particularly relatives uh, who find that the care uh, in the community uh, service charges that are being charged and levied by local authorities seem to vary from authority to authority. Uh, and at the present moment, as the petitioner has indicated, there doesn't seem to be any uh, standard charges or a guidance on standard charges. While there is guidelines issued by uh, the Scottish Government, it's up to local authorities, as I understand it, to then uh, determine their own charging regimes. Mm -hmm. And it may be useful if we continue with this petition uh, for further examination. I do know in terms of the, the information we've received, uh, why the Scottish Government has been looking at this issue, uh, and there's uh, a short life working group has been established uh, in this month uh, to look, review social work complaints and appeals procedures. It might be useful if we investigate through the Scottish Government whether or not that short life working group will also look at uh, the issue of charges that are being levied by local authorities because it, it's the possibility we could end up once again in a postcode lottery in terms of the situation that you find yourself in if you live in one authority uh, you may be charged one level and then a neighbouring authority may charge a different level. And it's the inequity that people view uh, that takes place uh, that they need to get some answers for. And while the uh, local authorities quite rightly may say it's because the level of service is much greater or much better than the neighbouring authority, I think we should be looking for a common approach mm -hmm. to charging regimes and also delivery of services. Thank you for that. Is there any other member to contribute? Uh, are members happy with the, uh, that we should continue this petition to speak to Scottish Government COSLA, particularly take up John Wilson's point yeah. about the short life working group, which I think is a very good one. Sure. Is that agreeable? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Right. Uh, I could invite Gil Patterson if you would just take a seat. Thank you. Um, agenda item three is consideration of current petitions. Uh, the next item is PE 1105 by Marjorie McChance on St Margaret of Scotland Hospice. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. Uh, and Gil Patterson, um, can I welcome to the meeting, uh, is here again, and you're very welcome for coming along again uh, to speak on behalf of the petition. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, committee members. Um, can I say that since uh, I was last here at the last uh, appearance, uh, can I draw the attention to the fact that the uh, hospice has enjoyed an HEI inspection to which it scored the maximum across the range of six sectors, uh, the, the highest category. And I think it's pretty unheard of to achieve that. And I know that some of the members here supported it, which I'm very, and the hospice is very grateful for that support. 
but the HEI inspection can be seen and it can be certainly measured. But the bit that the members here won't see is the other part of it. It's how it, how the service that's provided uh, helps individuals. And if I say to you that um, I, not every day, not every week, and not every month, but frequently, people just across the board, when I'm going about my normal business, will come up and talk to me about the hospice itself. It's almost like Sister Rita, who's the chief executive, has written a wee note out to give to people and say, you better keep him on his toes. Go and say that to him, because the expression is almost universal. And it's about the quality of the service and how loved ones and family members and friends have, have, have been dealt with. But of course, that, that comes at a price. And the price, and this is where my fears are, that the amount of uh, responsibility an effort that lands in the shoulders of the board to fundraise for what I call a shortfall uh, from the resources provided, I think causes enormous strain and I worry because of the, the amount of giving uh, by uh, to charities at the present time is, is under strain. And I worry at some time that uh, that St Margaret's wouldn't able, be able to cope. I know they're very in, in, innovative and they put an awful lot of effort in uh, to fundraising. And when, when you consider that the hospice is actually the lowest in Scotland in terms of what it receives from the health board, I, I don't think that is measured against the service that they provide. And I, I don't know what the right number is, to be quite frank with you, but if I was to say that you would expect the norm to be the average, uh, you know whether the average would be enough is, is even a question. However, they, they don't get the average, they get the lowest. Um, there's certainly an expectation on the part of the government, and you could probably see from the letter from the Cabinet Secretary, that a res resolution should be, uh, you know, be on offer in, in this regard. There are discussions taking place, and I really think with a bit of goodwill and perseverance that we can come to uh, uh, an amicable uh, solution to this, where both parties uh, would feel comfortable. I think it's, it, it is possible and practical. And as I said, there's discussions taking place right at the minute. The one thing I can't say to this committee, I've run out of ideas, to be quite frank, asking this committee to do something. But I would say because of what's happening at the present time, this would be the wrong time to close the petition. I think the fact that it is a live petition in itself is very, very helpful to uh, the process. And at this particular time, I think it would be the wrong message if the petition was closed, that somehow that the problem has gone away. I don't regard this as a local issue because it's the, the fact that, that uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde have a number of organisations uh, like this, and this is ob obviously the lowest level. There is a national thing happening there. I, I, I wish I could solve it locally. I really do. I wish I could uh, you know, use my office to, to make the, the difference that's needed. I, 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 but, so I need your help, and I would ask you to, uh, on that regard uh, to keep this petition open. I could thank um, Gil Partson for coming along again. You've been very loyal supporting the petition to the committee. Uh, and although, as you know, the, the petitions appeared, I think, 17 times uh, before us, that, in a sense, isn't to reduce the value of it. And I was delighted that the inspection was so high um, uh, that you recently re referred to. As you say, I think the Minister made it clear that he was looking for a, a resolution to this very quickly. Um, and whilst at one level it's important that we do move petitions along, I think I personally would be quite keen to know what the outcome would be. Uh, would members be happy that we do continue this until we get a resolution? Continue. John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Can I declare that I paid a visit to St Margaret of Scotland Hospice a couple of weeks ago uh, and I met with Sister Rita, uh, the Chief Executive, and others uh, and was given a, a tour around the hospice to uh, meet some of the staff and others within the hospice. Uh, and I can say from a visit that it is an excellent facility uh, and clearly, as Gil Parsons indicated, 
the recent report uh, which clearly shows inspection report shows that it has seen viewed as an excellent facility. There are a couple of questions I think we I would like to examine further, convener, uh, in relation to this, uh, particularly the response from Greater uh, Glasgow and Clyde uh, Health Board. Uh, they actually make reference uh, in, a, in a couple of paragraphs. They make reference to funding for the agreed services, uh, and I would like to try and examine that in terms of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board in terms of is there a difference between the agreed service delivery uh, for the other five hospices in the, the board area and St Margaret of Scotland hospice, uh, particularly the because they you know Greater Glasgow and uh, Clyde Health Board uh, identify other issues like spiritual support uh, and bereavement support. And I would like to know uh, where funding could be provided, but it's trying to find out whether or not, uh, as we've tried to do uh, in the past in the, this committee, is find out if there is parity between the funding for the hospices and, in this health board area. But also, uh, I'd like to ask the Scottish Government and uh, the health board mm -hmm. What's happening with the National Hospice Quality Improvement Forum? Because the Health Board makes reference to the Hospice uh, Quality Improvement Forum uh, and say in their response that has not been established yet and the Board is awaiting guidance from this uh, group. So it would be useful to find out where we are with that forum, when it is likely to uh, conclude its deliberations in relation to the, the advice that they will be issuing to health boards so that we can actually uh, take that forward. But as Gil Parson has indicated and yourself, I think until we get some of these answers, I think we need to keep this petition open uh, to get those answers because it just seems to be that every time we seem to have a brick wall, another piece of information or another uh, brick falls off that that opens up a... Uh, an opening to say, well, there are other issues here, and clearly it may be that the, the hospices in the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board area are not being treated equally, uh, but it would be useful just to examine that. But I'm quite keen we get some answers about this quality improvement forum that's been suggested in the response by the Health Board. Yes. Jackson Carlo? Yes, I do am keen that we keep the petition open. I have to say, uh, I suppose I've declared an interest previously in that a relative of my wife's side of the family was nursed uh, d at the end of life at St Margaret's. But, but I think the hallmark of this whole petition has been that it literally has been like trying to get hold of a bar of soap in the bath. Um, it really was not, a, 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 a solution was not in prospect until the health board's preferred route collapsed around them, which then led to a much more positive discussion taking place with St Margaret of Scotland. But the impression was always created in the minds of all the MSPs and activists who've been involved on behalf of this hospice that it was never what they wanted to do but eventually felt they had to do despite it seeming to be the most obvious course of action to everybody involved in supporting St Margaret's. And I think Gil Patterson is right. Simply because of the history of this, I think the very existence of the petition being live itself is one of the things which will help to ensure that we get hold of that bar of soap in the bath. And I would really like, given the very explicit um, commitment of the Cabinet Secretary uh, to the Health Board to arrive at a resolution, as you suggested, Convener, almost, I would say, to have the petition held open until the Cabinet Secretary, as himself, accepted that he believes a solution has now been agreed. Uh, and at that point, I think I would be content. Can I, can I, I mean, I support certainly the view that we, should, we continue, uh, and as Jackson and Carla said, until the Cabinet Secretary is satisfied. One concern I have is, is from the, the note from um, the petitioner regarding uh, the Glasgow the Health Board in terms of how it allocates the funding, because it appears that, according to the letter, that the, 50, the, the NHS board funds 50% of the agreed service costs of St Margaret's, as I said, but there is no comparison or a feeling of equity as to you know how do they, how do they actually treat St Margaret's in relation to the other hospitals. And I really think uh, I'm surprised that there isn't some means by which 
uh, there is a value proposition in terms of mm. how that funding is arrived at. And I really think that the, the uh, you know, out of courtesy, uh, if nothing else, you should indicate uh, the, the basis of the, the funding arrangement that's in place. Right. Thank you for that. Does any member wish to contribute? I think it's clear then that members uh, have taken Gopartson's advice and we urge to continue uh, this petition. It would be really good after 17 hearings, so to speak, that we get a resolution. Uh, and clearly members are all uh, speaking very highly of the care that's provided by the hospice. But it's, I think the key issue is about equity and I think we need to get that established. So can I thank Gopartson again for coming along? And let's hope, for, let's hope at the next meeting that you turn up we will finally get this issue resolved. So thank you again for for attending, and we'll continue this petition uh, to hopefully await a resolution of this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the second current petition today is PE 1367 by Andrew Deans, who's a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament and the Office of Scottish Youth Parliament on banning mosquito devices. Members of a note by the clerk and the submissions. Uh, I think members will recall this is perhaps one of the most significant petitions that we've yeah. had. Uh, I particularly remember having both the inventor of the device um, and Andrew Deans uh, before us. Uh, when even I think the inventor of the device was saying in an ideal world we wouldn't have it. Um, clearly we had the minister before us as well and uh, in my own view on this is there's clear issues around, around United Nations Convention of Rights of the Child um, and general issue about uh, being prejudicial against one sector um, of the community. Um, in one sense I'm actually appalled that we still have these devices around and I'm mystified why we cannot get a resolution to whether the Scottish Government and indeed local authorities can actually ban them if they think there's a legal case to do so. It appears to be in this huge impasse between who's got the power to do it. I'm not in any doubt, particularly from Fergus Ewing, the previous Minister's um, evidence to the previous uh, committee, that the Scottish Government are equally appalled by these devices. But that's one thing. It's also about having the teeth and the power to actually ban them. Um, clearly, we got a very strong letter, I think, from uh, the Children's Commissioner, which I think was very helpful uh, indeed. And as you know, the Scottish Youth Parliament are very, very keen that we defer this until they pull together evidence that they can then submit back to us. And I think, if I remember correctly, they were quite keen that we sort of effectively recalled the Minister and projected that new material to them. Members will note that I think a week Friday, we're actually having a joint meeting here in Parliament with the Youth Parliament, and I'm absolutely certain uh, that this item will uh, be before us at that stage for our joint meeting. But certainly my advice to the committee is that we take the advice of the Youth Parliament and defer this um, until they've been able to pull together further detailed evidence. For, uh, John Wilson. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Convener. The, um, I welcome the response from the Dan Bailey, the Commissioner for Children and Young People, who's given a commitment uh, later in the financial year uh, for the Commission to have an, uh, a look at the issue. Uh, and it's basically how we tie in the further information from Scottish Youth Parliament in the petition and the possibility of the Commission uh, doing work on this issue as well. And it may be useful uh, that we seek advice from the Commissioner as to when exactly he expects. He's given us rough times of when he hopes to timetable this uh, inquiry in, but it would be useful to get some uh, definite dates as to when he hopes to conclude his inquiry, because it may be that the Commissioner uh, can do more on this issue uh, than we can expect from the Scottish Government at the present moment, uh, but I do agree that we need to keep pressure on the Scottish Government as well to try and get a resolution to this issue, uh, but I think with the Commissioner, the Scottish Youth Parliament, and pressure the committee can place on the uh, government, then hopefully we can get some resolution to this. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks, Convener. I would certainly agree with your comments and, and the comments of uh, John Wilson. Um, I'd also concur with uh, Tam Bailey, the Commissioner for Children and Young People's comment uh, in his submission, in which he states that um, the pet petitioner has shown considerable determination in pursuing this matter, uh, and I think he has to be certainly uh, commended for that. Um, given the concerns um, the Commissioner has stated and the concerns previously stated by the National Autistic As Association, I feel we should give the Scottish Youth Parliament um, the chance uh, to pull further evidence together. Yeah. Um, however, it would be helpful, I think, if they could, um, when they're collating that evidence, 
uh, if they looked at whether uh, the mosquito devices have been withdrawn or banned in any other uh, European countries, it would be interesting to find out if, if that has been the case elsewhere. Um, so, you know, perhaps if they're listening, if they would care to uh, look at that aspect as well. Jackson Carlo. I'm always willing to defer to the good sense of the convener in this committee, but I have to say, left to my own views, uh, having listened and reviewed again the evidence of the Minister when she was last before us, I have to say I would have been minded to close the petition. Uh, I'm not satisfied that, in fact, as the Minister has indicated uh, quite succinctly in the response, that despite the objectionable nature of these devices, um, they exist in numbers which are an operational practice, um, or that there is um, the sound evidence that would be needed to take this through a parliamentary legislative process. But I, I'm happy to defer to your own advice on the matter. Um, certainly, I appreciate Jackson Carlyle's comments. I think in terms of what is the demand in very comments, I think partly what the Youth Parliament are saying is that they want to go away to determine what the, what the use has been of the mosquito devices. I yeah. feel it's a very long time to do that, Convener. Sure. I mean, the, the petition was first raised two years ago. I appreciate the perseverance. I, I'm disappointed that we're only at the stage now where they might think that putting that information together is of value and support mm -hmm. of the petition. Mm -hmm. And I was, appreciate your comments. Um, Adam Ingram. I do think there's a, there's a question of principle as well as practice uh, with this particular um, issue, uh, Convener. So, in, in terms of the demand for evidence that the Minister puts up, I can understand uh, where she's coming from, but uh, the, the fact of the matter that this device is specifically aimed at young people, mm -hmm. um, so it's discriminatory in nature. Um, therefore, I think there is a, there's a logic to legislation in this area that um, perhaps does not in, need to be underpinned by a significant uh, large body of evidence. That said, I thought the, the letter from the, the MSYP was very robust and needs to be commend, <laughs> commended in the vigour of his approach uh, to, to this issue. And I think they deserve the opportunity to bring forward um, any evidence that they managed to collect on, on this particular point. Thank you. Do other members wish to contribute? Thanks, Madam. Okay, convener, if I just uh, come back in, um, it might be an idea. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't on the petitions committee when um, the, the panel were interviewed, but would it be possible to contact the manufacturers again just to ask how many, not uh, individual details, but just to ask how many have been sold in Scotland? Yes, that's certainly. It would be good to get that figure, I think. Yeah. Do other members wish to contribute? And going back to my early point about um, our meeting with the Scottish Youth Parliament a week Friday, could I suggest that we formally contact the Youth Parliament to say we want this item placed on the agenda? Because I think Jackson Carroll's got a fair point that in terms of speed is an issue for us as well. So that is our next meeting, which is not far away. Could I suggest that we do that so that, because all the committee are going to meet that day, so I think it's important that is, that's down in the agenda. Are members agreeable then that we, we defer this to allow the Scottish Youth Parliament, albeit with some sort of time scales, to have to get further evidence to take back to us? Right, thank you for that. Um, the third current petition today is PE 1383 by Helen McDade on behalf of the John Muir Trust on better protection for wild land. Members, I note by the clerk and the submissions, um, and I uh, welcome Helen McDade, who's in the gallery with us today, who gave, uh, I think, evidence to us recently. Uh, members will know, I think, that the Minister was, uh, if I quote correctly, not persuaded by the case for any new um, designations. Um, and I understand that we're still awaiting um, from SNH the status of the Phase 2 of the mapping exercises, which is quite crucial. I think on memory we agreed that we would ask Helmut Day to give evidence once we had the, uh, the Phase 2 mapping exercise before us. Um, can I ask uh, John Wilson if he's any comments? And then check Brody. Convener, thank you. Uh, my comments are really along the lines of I'm disappointed, uh, to say the least, in the Minister's response uh, in terms of the letter submitted to the committee. And uh, I'd been interested to see uh, Helen McDade's response to the Minister's letter uh, coming forward. And, because in one paragraph, he actually says, First, I am not persuaded that there is a case for a new statutory designation 
for wild land for a number of reasons, then sets out the reasons, and then goes on to say, we intend to consult upon both a draft Scottish planning policy and main issues report for the third national planning framework in March this year. The question of the appropriate policy approach to wild land is one on which we will be very keen to hear views as part of this consultation. Seems to be a contradiction there in terms of letter convener. At uh, one point he says he's not persuaded, and then he's saying he's keen to hear the views. As, and the question's got to be asked to the Scottish Government, are they going to listen to the views being expressed and act upon those views if there's clear evidence to actually get a new designation? Or is he going to stay with his, the line in the letter, which is he is persuaded uh, that not to... Uh, bring in a new designation. So that there would be seek clarification uh, from uh, the Scottish Government as to what exactly the, consult the purpose of the consultation and where the consultation will lead us to if the, it clearly shows there needs to be a new designation and would the Minister change his view if he, and, and could be persuaded uh, because there's no point in having a consultation if the Minister's already set in his view. Uh, on the, this issue, so I need to seek clarification from the Minister on the, uh, and the Scottish Government on this view. And like you, uh, Convener, I'm also uh, interested to find out where SNH have got to in their mapping exercise, because we were assured that this would be done in 2012. It hasn't, as far as I'm aware, it's not been carried out. And until we see the SNH uh, report, then we can't uh, determine whether or not uh, we should continue to support the petition and get ideas yeah. on how we take this petition forward. Thank you. Just before I throw open to Chip Rohn to put questions, I mean, one option for the committee, obviously, is to invite the, the chair and our chief exec of SNH to come and give a brief contribution to a future committee hearing, if members are agreeable. Chip Rohn? Yeah, I, I was about to say that one of the things that we should do is, uh, because it just doesn't apply to, to this particular issue in terms of the relationship between guidance given to planning authorities, uh, the lack of consistency, the inability to apparently produce you know, spatial frameworks in, in, in development plans in particular areas, uh, and taking on board consideration of, of, uh, uh, of the definition of wild land. I have one concern, which is when I addressed earlier, in terms of the designation of wild land might be uh, permissible, but that should not obstruct economic development. And it comes back to the issue of of who owns the land. Uh, and and I, I kind of keep asking this question, we would after the EET committee had a look at it, that we only know that of 21% 20, of Scotland's land, who actually owns it? And I think uh, the, the one of the one of the criteria that has to be looked at uh, in, in, in this designation is uh, the role of landowners, quasi-landowners, or what have you. Um, so I think that obviously has to come into consideration. But in another uh, discussion, clearly the, 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 the role of SNH is important and, and should be much more clear uh, in terms of uh, guidance, and if not necessarily guidance, legislation that might have to be applied in terms of ensuring that uh, planning policy considers uh, the natural landscape and considers that uh, in, in line with whatever developments that uh, may or may not be required. Thank you. Uh, Anne McTaggart. Convener, you know, just really to say that um, I would welcome SNH for to be along at the, the committee and really just to, to give us their status on where the Phase 2 mapping exercise is now. Yeah, thank you for that. Jackson Carlow. Yeah, Convener, I thought this was one of the most ineffectual ministerial letters I've read uh, in response to a petition. It struck me that Mr Wheelhouse is trying to wheelbarrow the issue uh, into the file marked with no further action. And its hallmark is a suggestion that he knows something we don't know. He's not prepared to tell us what it is, but it absolutely persuades him of his case and then conflates it in the second half with a suggestion of sinister forces who are acting against the government's energy policy as underpinning their motivation and seeking to provide this um, uh, protection for best areas of wild land. I think, yes, the SNH we want to hear from, but I think we're getting to the point where the people who are frustrating progress in this need to stand up before this committee and explain to us why. Would you, on the back of that, I think the committee sound like they're quite keen to have the Chief Executive and Chair of SNH. Would you like Paul Wheelhouse to be... I, 
So could I just finish I, that? Sorry. Um, uh, would you suggest that we have the minister along at this stage, or is that? I, I, I think we need to hear from the minister. I'm not sure at what point, because I don't want him to be able to come and say, um, "I hope at some stage to be able to share further information with you," but I can't yet. I, I want the information to be available, and then for him to actually explain to us what it is that's persuaded him in that information not to take any further action. Okay. Sorry, Chip Brody. <laughs> Well, first thing, the support for Jackson Carlos. I agree with. with <laughs> uh, I, frankly, I'm getting sick, fed up with particularly you know, certain bodies uh, who are being given work to do. And I, uh, I'm sorry if this offends SNH, but it has applied in other areas, as I mentioned. We should know exactly what it is they're trying to do, who's responsible for it, when's it going to be produced, uh, and you know, if they can't do it, then we need to look. Uh, suggest to the government that there might be other ways of doing this. Because this, as I said earlier, doesn't just crop up here, it's cropped up elsewhere. Uh, and I think it is important that they, they come here and explain exactly what it is they're doing uh, without any obfuscation at all. Yeah. I think that, that's a good point. It sounds like members are of, of one mind. That perhaps is the first step then we want the chair and the chief exec of SNH. And then once we've had that, we can just. Uh, determine at what stage we have the minister and perhaps help the date back to the committee so that we've got a sort of completeness. Members be agreeable to that approach? That agreed? Thank you very much. Um, the first current petition is PE1428 by Councillor uh, Douglas Fyland on behalf of Gail First on improvements for the 83. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. Uh, members will know I've got uh, a regional interest in this issue as well. Uh, and clearly this is uh, a really huge issue for logistics, communication, transport, business uh, in the Gail and Butte. Uh, there is a suggestion that we defer this petition until Transport Scotland has given us a full response to the 83 study report, which seems sensible. Would members be agreeable? There was a late response from Transport Scotland yeah. that came in to do a bit different right. information. Thank you. Um, the fifth current petition is PE 1439 by Jonathan McCall on betting loan shops in deprived communities. Members are noted by the clerk and the submissions. I think, again, this was a very interesting petition, um, and we've got quite full responses back. Um, but it seems, I think, to be sensible that we continue this until and, and write to Scottish Government to try and get uh, completeness before we make any final decisions on this issue. Members be agreeable? Thank you. And the sixth current petition is PE 1444 by Florence Kennedy on Mutual Repairs Incentive Scheme. Members are noted by the clerk and the submissions. Can invite contributions from members. I'll give members a second just to catch up with the paperwork. I think there's certainly, certainly some work being done by Scottish Government on traditional building health check. Um, again, it may be sensible just to get some clarification from Scottish Government on this before we make any sort of final decisions, which does seem to be very relevant to the petitioner. Members agreeable? Thank you for that. Uh, the seventh current petition is PE 1447 by Jerry McClellan on protection for landlords. Members are noted by the clerk and the submissions. Um, can find uh, contributions from members, uh, but there is certainly, I think, an argument that we could close this petition under Rule 15.7 on the basis that the issues raised have been considered uh, fully by the Scottish Government. Are members agreeable? Thank you. Uh, the eighth current petition is PE 1448 by Grant Thompson on improving awareness of the cancer ri risks in organ transplantation. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. Um, and again, I invite contributions from members, but Again, a familiar story. Um, I would also suggest that we do chase up the health birds that haven't responded to us. I know Chip Brody mentioned that, that earlier. Yeah, can I actually just, just... Yes, Chip Brody. Sorry. I'm not sure what, what some of these public bodies think we are doing here. We're here to represent those that, that, that offer petitions. And frankly, I looked at a, a, it was an earlier petition, I can't remember which one, where out of 32 local authorities, we got 20 responses. I think, Convener, it's imperative that these public bodies who are here equally to, 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 to serve those that we represent understand that we are not asking these questions just because we think they're nice to ask. We want answers and we want answers from all of them and we want them timiously and I think uh, unless we adopt that kind of approach we're going to continue getting this sort of half-hearted approach to uh, providing answers uh, and it, in my book it's wholly unacceptable. Well, I think I would obviously, clearly I'm sure all members agree with Chip Brody. Just to remind the committee of what I've done, I think, on the suggestion at the last meeting, 
uh, I asked for this to be raised at the conveners group. And as members know, obviously all conveners attend that. And I'm sure we're not the only committee to suffer from this. I think there needs to be both a parliament and a government-wide um, uh, more than suggestion to ask that public bodies at the very least respond to the democratically elected Scottish Parliament. So, uh, like Chick Brody, I share his invitation that we can't deal with petitions on many occasions because we haven't got full responses uh, from local authorities and health boards. Did, sorry, Jackson Carla, did you have a Yes, just briefly, convener. I mean, is it six? Is it right? Six boards have responded. Uh, the only thing I do wonder, having read the responses, is whether or not the direction of travel within them is not sufficiently clear that there is a case to recommend uh, to refer the petition to the Health and Sport Committee now. Okay. Um, well, I just did, so I don't lose the issue about yeah. non non response or non responding. That's certainly an item that will be raised. Fortunately, won't be able to raise it this week. But the next yeah. okay. the next conveners uh, committee, I will definitely be able to raise this issue, and I'll feed that back um, to all members. Uh, and clearly, if this continues, you know, I think we'll need to make sure that we we deal this in as strong a possible way. On Jackson Carlos' point, could I just ask what the committee's view is on whether we've got sufficient material, so to speak, to refer this on, or do members want to wait until we've got a complete response? Amit Taggart. Convener, we are hearing back um, there will be a Scottish transplant group in March. Should we hold on to it until that time? Um, obviously, there's, there's still, I think, a long way to go within this petition, um, given that there's no NHS Scotland guidance there. Um, I'm of mind for to hold on to it until we, till we hear what happens in March. Okay, okay. But um, other members, Chip okay. Brody. Yeah, yeah. I, I take Jackson Carr's point as well is that there there is a bit. Of, uh, it's important also to move petitions on as much as we can. I suppose a bit for me would would rather have a complete set of information. Um, but nevertheless, Jackson Carl has got a point. We need to be aware that we don't want to be sitting in petitions for long lengths of time. But it's not really our problem. It's the problem is the lack of information from the health boards. Yeah. Angus McDowell. Yeah. With regard to the other health boards, um, are we writing back out to them or are we just sitting waiting to wait? The, 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 the clerks always right. chase things up if there's, if there's considerable delays. So they're well aware that if we don't get response in time that they're chased up. Okay. Um, so we, are, we will continue this, but we will take on board Jackson Carr's point that we need to make decisions as quickly as possible on this. The ninth current petition is PE1453 by Callan Wilson, after the Evening Times and the Kidney Research UK Scotland on an opt-out system of organ donation. Members have a note by the clerk and the spice briefing. Again, I think members will be aware this was, a, I think, a first-class petition, and I think the Evening Times, assist, I think all members would appreciate did an excellent job at raising awareness about this particular issue. Again, we're still waiting for further information, and I think, as uh, I'm at Tank Hinsdale, we're waiting publication of the new Scottish plan for donation and transportation, which is expected uh, early 2013, which we're currently obviously at. Uh, but again, I think it makes sense to have, for completeness, to have these guidelines before making final decisions. Members agreeable? Yeah. And the tenth and final current petition is PE1461 by William Campbell on protection for third parties in the planning process. Members have a note by the clerk and submission. Um, I think I raised at the last committee um, that I know William Campbell from a Hands and Islands background. Um, but again, familiar story today is we are awaiting the ACPOS response. Um, and again, their, if their parts of groups were not getting responses from quick enough, I'll certainly be chasing them up as well. Members agreeable? Um, and as agreed at item one, the committee will now go into private session for the final agenda item of today's meeting and are allowed just to uh, suspend for two minutes to allow members of the gallery to leave. <laughs>